Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody to the ICAI session for Indian CAs who are interested in achieving their Canadian CPA designation. My name is Michael Levy. I am a co-director of the PASS program. I'll be doing the first part of the session. The second part of the session will be done by my partner, Ira Walfish. Hi, everyone. I'm Hi, everyone. I'm Ira. I um, hope everyone can hear me, and I'll be picking up from Michael um, like halfway through the session. Go Let ahead, me Michael. Begin, thank you. Let me begin by talking about what we'll be covering over the course of the session. And I do welcome questions anytime throughout the session. If you have a question, uh, please ask it. We'll either answer it immediately, or in some instances, we may wait until we get through a couple of slides and then answer your question. But we'll try to answer everybody's questions. I'm sure people you know, want to learn as much as possible. The way we're going to construct the session is as follows. We're going to start off with a description of the CPA program in Canada and how you achieve the CFE. The CFE is the final exam that you need to pass to become a CPA in Canada. We'll talk about the program and the structure of the exam. We'll then talk about the importance of case writing and technical. As you'll see throughout the presentation, the Canadian CPA exam is quite different from the exam that CAs in India write. It focuses exclusively on case writing rather than short answer questions. We'll talk more about that as we go through the session. We'll then talk about the PASS CP program for Indian students. PASS is, has actually designed a program specifically for Indian and other international students with a main focus being on Indian students. We're actually the only, uh, the only organization in Canada that caters specifically to Indian students and deals with their needs. I will go over the details of that program as we go through the, as we go through the presentation we'll also take a look at schedules uh, so we have a fairly flexible uh, but many different options when it comes to schedules for attending the course we'd then like to show you some testimonials from former students particularly indian students who've taken our course and have been successful on the exam we'll then very briefly deal with registration uh, how do you register with pass if you're interested and then for the last part of the presentation uh you see is really catered to CAs living in India. I believe today we have people both living in Canada as well as in India. Part seven is specifically for people living in India. So if you're living in Canada, you don't need you don't really need to stay for part seven of the presentation unless you have friends in India and you'd like to, to listen to the presentation on their behalf. But otherwise, uh, for those living in Canada, the presentation effectively ends after part six. So what's the purpose of this overall session? The purpose of the session is to provide you with a really good understanding of the process for obtaining a Canadian CPA and how to prepare for the CPA exam. So by the time you leave the session today, we hope that you'll have a pretty good understanding of how the CPA process works and you'll, you'll at least have an idea of where do I start if I want to achieve a CPA, which involves passing an exam called the CP. So let's start off with part one. We're gonna talk about a, the, the program itself for achieving a CP, CPA, as well as the structure of this exam you need to write called the CP. Let me begin by explaining what a Canadian student would do to get their CPA, and then I can explain to you how Indian CAs are treated. A typical Canadian student would have to take four modules, four technical modules, and write exams for each module. The student would then have to go to two additional modules. One is called Capstone 1 and one is called Capstone 2, both of which we'll describe in detail a little bit later. And then they would write the final exam called the CP. So in Capstone 1, for now, I'll just give you a very brief understanding of what it is and more detail later. Capstone 1 involves working with a group on a large business case. Capstone 2 involves writing previous CP cases. So a Canadian student has to go through a fairly lengthy program which for many students takes a couple of years. The nice thing for Indian CAs is based on an, an agreement, an MOU, between the Indian Accounting Association and CPA Canada, Indian CAs can go directly to the final exam called the CP. They don't need to do the technical modules, and they also don't need to do Capstone 1 and 2. They're still responsible for the same technical knowledge that a Canadian student is responsible for, and but they don't have to go through the modules. Of course, PASS will help you fill in that knowledge that you would not have acquired by not going through the modules, but you don't need to go through these technical modules. Now, the 2020 CP is 
September 9th to 11th. And then there are two CEPI scheduled for 2021, May 26th to 28th, and September 13th to 15th. So at the end of the day, just to summarize, a Canadian student first goes through four technical modules, then capstone one and two, and then the CEPI, an Indian CA, because they already have a professional designation, and because of this special agreement, this MOU between Canada and India, can go directly to the final exam called the CP. So let's take a look now at a description of the CP. The CP is a three day long exam. As I mentioned earlier, the CP is, is a case based exam. There are no multiple choice questions, no short answer questions. It's exclusively a case based exam. On day one, you would write a comprehensive case. It's a four hour case, and it's based on Capstone One. As I mentioned earlier, in Capstone One, students work on a big business case, and they're dealing with an imaginary company called X. When you come into day one of the CP, you'll be dealing with that same company, but, the, but you might be a few years down the road and the company is facing new challenges. I will describe in a little more detail how Capstone One works a little bit later. But for the time being, Day one, you're effectively dealing with the same company that students would have dealt with in Capstone One. Day two is the roll comp. It's a five hour case. The reason it's called the roll comp is that students actually have to choose among four roles before they enter the exam. We'll talk about that when we describe the roll comp in just a couple of minutes. Day three, you're going to be writing multi cases. Multi cases are typically between 70 and 90 minutes. You have three such cases, and they add up in total to four hours. So you could have three cases that are 80 minutes, one that's 70, one that's 90. But at the end of the day, the three cases need to add up to four hours. The C Over the course of the three-day exam, you're going to be tested on six competencies, audit and assurance, financial reporting, management accounting, finance, taxation, and strategy and governance. The most heavily tested areas on the exam are two and three, financial reporting and management accounting. I just want to step in here for one second to interrupt, Michael. Um, they mark day one separately. So day one, coming, day one is pass up. fail. Oh, okay. And day two and day three, they mark together, pass fail. Okay. So let's go through each of the three days of the CP. The first day of the CP is a four-hour case, as we said before. It's based on the case used in Capstone 1. So basically, as I said earlier, in Capstone 1, you'll be working on a business case, and you'll be dealing with a particular company. When you get into day one of the CP, you're dealing with the same company, but it's now a few years later, and that company is dealing with some new challenges. And you'll be dealing with various operational and strategic decisions that need to be made. As Ira pointed out, Day one is marked separately from days two and three. And so you can pass day one, even if you fail day two and three, or you can pass day two and three and fail day one. They're marked totally separately. When it comes to day one, you'll simply achieve a pass or a fail. It's one, one, or, one or the other. There's no mark. It's just pass or fail. The purpose of day one is very non-technical, okay? It's meant to test your general business skills and your case writing skills. It's not intended to be a very technical day. Day two of the exam is a very challenging day. Day two is a five hour roll comp. And the way the roll comp works is as follows. The case will have financial accounting and or management accounting, and everybody has to address these issues. So what they can do on the roll comp, which is a five hour big case, is they will test financial accounting or management accounting or both, okay? Historically, on some CPs, they've only tested one. On others, they've tested both. Then, in addition to addressing financial and or management accounting, before you come into the exam, you're going to choose from one of four roles. And again, you'll do this before you actually come to the CP. The four roles from which you will choose are audit, tax, performance management, or finance. You'll have to choose from one of those four roles. The way it's going to work is as follows. Every student will have to address the financial accounting or, and or management accounting issues that arise. Those are called common requires that everybody will have to deal with. The rest of the requires will be role specific. 
So if you choose audit as your role, then you will be dealing with financial accounting and or management accounting, and all the rest of the requires you deal with will relate to audit or what we call assurance. If you choose performance management as your role, then you'll deal with financial accounting and or management accounting, and all the rest of your requires that you need to deal with will relate to performance management. So at the end of the day, the maximum number of competencies you will need to deal with on day two will be three. Management accounting and or financial accounting, so that's a maximum of two, plus the role requires, which would be the third. So the maximum number of competencies you'll be dealing with will be three competencies. Any questions on day two of the exam? So there's I, one question. There's one question here. What's really a business case? Someone is asking. So, if you, as Michael was saying, on day one, um, when he's saying a business case, the way they describe it, it's like you were doing a presentation to the board of directors. A business case means they take a company and they're talking about strategy, and the company wants to go into different areas down the road, and they give you a I don't know, 15, 20 page case, and you have to kind of respond to the different decisions mm -hmm. that they want to make. And it's not supposed to be very technical. I'm now talking day one. It's supposed to be more high level, as if you were responding and doing a presentation to a board of directors. That's what they mean by a business case. So Michael said it's like using SWOT, strength, weaknesses, opportunity, threats, more in the governance area. And it's not really supposed to be technical as opposed to day two and day three. Thank you. Uh, now, when it comes to day three of the exam, day three, as I mentioned earlier, you're writing shorter cases called multis. The cases will range anywhere from 70 to 90 minutes. And as I mentioned before, they'll add up to four hours. Unlike the case of the roll comp that I just described, which you write on day two, on day three, you may have as many as four or five competencies tested in each case. Over the course of all three cases, you will be tested on all six competencies, and you'll have an opportunity to deal with each competency more than once. Unlike the case of day two, where people choose a specific, from one of four roles, on day three, everybody answers the same cases. So the same three cases are dealt with by everybody. There is no choice at all. Day two and three, as Ira pointed out earlier, are marked together. So as I said before, you can pass day two and three and fail day one or vice versa or vice versa. So the nice thing is that it's not a question of all or nothing. Uh, hopefully everybody will make it through all three days their first try. But if that doesn't work, you could pass part of the exam. You could pass day one without passing day two and three or vice versa. So it's not all or nothing. Here are some key facts about the CP. Sorry, Everyone, Michael. I'm just going to interrupt for one second. There's a number sure. of questions here on day one. Okay, sure. um, and on and on on the role. So a number of people are asking which role does a person from India have to choose a certain role, um, or if you practice, do you have to choose a certain role? So the answer is anyone from India has the identical choice as a Canadian student. You can choose any of the four roles, but. Just to answer, this may come up later, but to answer now, if somebody wants to practice, to be in public practice, you really should choose the audit role. However, not to complicate life, but if you're from, if you are attending the CFI and you're from India with an Indian CA, regardless of where you live, in Canada or India, um, and you ultimately want to practice, even if you choose audit as the role, you will ultimately have to write another exam called the PDPA after the CFI, which is an easier type of exam. We're not really going to get into that today, but that is what will happen ultimately down the road if you want to work in a public accounting firm. When it comes to the role, you can choose any of the four roles, but if you want to, pub if you want to practice down the road, it probably would make more sense to choose assurance. Um, technically, Michael, you can comment on this. I'm not sure it's going to make much of a difference because you will have to anyway write another exam down the road if you want a public practice. Yeah, I would agree with I would agree with I, I would agree with what Ira said. For Canadian students, it's very important that if you want to be in public practice, that you choose assurance because Canadian students don't have to write the PDPA exam if they choose assurance as a role. But for Indian CAs, as Ira pointed out, in any case, you'll have to write the PDPA exam. So it doesn't matter as much which role you choose. 
I agree with Ira that it makes more sense to choose assurance if you're planning to go into public accounting. But at the end of the day, if, if you're more comfortable, say, with finance or another role, it won't make a huge difference because either way, you'll have to write a second exam after you, a second, much easier exam after you finish your CV. But you will be 100% a CPA. And what happens in real life is people don't immediately write this exam. You'd be in public practice at some point if you're going to make partner in the firm a number of years later, then you would be faced with having to write this other exam. It's not like you would go to this exam in a month or two months later or something like that. So it's not, that's why we're not focusing on it today. It's just not so important at the moment. Our job is to basically help you pass and get the CPA. You will be 100% a CPA. And then at some point down the road, um, you know, you'd have to worry about this PDPA. Another question that somebody asked if on day one there's a couple of parts to the exam. No, it's one question for four hours, as Michael said. It's one big case. There's no, um, like, sub parts. Um, I'm just looking at people. Just give me a second on some of these questions. Um, now, choosing the particular role does not, the only thing, like we just said now, choosing a particular role, there are no implications when it comes to working or anything like that. Um, no employer is going to care which role you chose on day two. They will not know the difference. Um, it really makes no difference. Um, what it really comes down to is, is what we just said. If you want public practice, it might make sense to choose assurance. And then the big reason to choose a role is what are you best at? If you love numbers or so, if you love numbers and you love finance, then quite frankly, choose finance. Um, if you like more qualitative, then you might want to choose assurance or PM, performance management. That's really what it comes down to. No one is going to care after the fact what role you chose. You're never going to be asked that question unless the one exception is, again, if you're ultimately choosing public practice, it may make more sense to choose assurance. Okay, I think I've answered a lot of these questions. Which elective course is favorite? Yeah. Okay, someone asked which elective course is favorite among students for day two. By far, because this exam has a lot of people in public practice, when you look at the statistics, assurance is number one by far. Number two is performance management. I'm just talking statistically across the board. Number three is finance. Number four is tax. There is a big drop off. That doesn't really matter. Ultimately, we want you to choose what you think you're going to be best at, um, so it doesn't really matter. I'm just telling you statistically, yes, there are way more people that end up choosing assurance because half the people writing the exam are in public practice, and as Michael said, Canadian students have to choose assurance if they want to stay in public practice ultimately. Ultimately, they have to choose assurance. So a ton of Canadian students are all choosing assurance and other people that like assurance. So that tends to be the winner as the most popular. But that doesn't really matter in ultimately what your choice is. <clears throat> and by the way, you'll make this choice at some point when you register for the exam. But you can always change up to, I don't know the exact date, but it's a few months within the exam. It's not like you're locked in and you have to immediately choose and this is something you should worry about now. You should not really worry about this now. Michael's just explaining it for information purposes. It's not really something that I think you guys should focus on a lot at this point. Okay, Michael, I think I've yeah, answered I, most of them. Sure, sure. There, there's just a few other questions that I'm just going to answer and then we'll move on. Okay. Somebody, somebody asks, only one case study is asked for in day two. Is there any subpart to that case? Uh, it's the, the, the bottom line is just really one big case. So there really are not subparts. There are different requires you need to deal with. There can be financial accounting, management accounting, and then the role requires, but it's really one large case. Um, another question here, um, on day three, do we have any option to opt from four roles? From day two, are we bound to be tested in all roles? On day three, you really don't have any options at all. Everybody addresses the same roles. The only day that's role specific is day two, okay? Um, the next question, you mentioned the day one cases about the capstone one business case that is five to 10 years in the future. If I'm directly writing a CP and do not know about the capstone case, will that be a drawback? That's a great question. And Ira will address this in more detail later on in the presentation. But just to give you a short answer now, that is one of the things that PASS will help you with. When we describe our course, we recognize that the vast majority of Indian CAs are not going to capstone one. So what we will do is we will give you a summary of the case. 
with the important parts of the case that you need to be familiar with so that you can write day one. We'll also give you uh, coaching on how to write the date. So we'll fill in that gap for you. We, we recognize that most Indian CAs are not doing capstone one, and therefore we will help you with that so you will not be at a disadvantage. Um, <clears throat> there's a question over here, where can we give the exam? Right now, the exam is only being written in Canada. Uh, there's a great deal of discussion to having it written also in India. It's already being written in a number of other places. It's already being written, written in, in Bermuda, the Caribbean, China. And from what we've been told by CPA Canada, they're looking very, very closely at offering it in India. In India. So right now, it's not yet being offered in India, but that could very well change. Um, the next question is, may we have soft copies of study materials on CP, which contains case study samples as explained by Michael? May we download from somewhere? Yeah, you know, if you don't mind, we'll get, if you could just, when we get to the course, we'll describe what we provide. But some of the material is definitely, a large part of our material is provided in soft copy. But if you don't mind, let's, we'll, we'll get more into what we provide uh, when Ira describes the program in, in just a few minutes. Um, People, just, I just want to say one thing. We are getting a lot of questions. It's a large group, so some of these questions we are going to we are going to touch on down the, down like in the lecture, okay, in, in a number of minutes. So if we don't immediately respond to your question um, when we get to when we get to the particular part in the lecture that is dealing with it, if you still have the question, maybe just type it in again um, because it doesn't make sense to now answer a bunch of these questions which relate to things that we are going to talk about and answer. It's going to be too disjointed. So we'll try and answer questions as we're dealing with specific topics when people ask questions kind of on those topics. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Sure, thank you, Ira. The, the last question I'll answer just because um, it actually relates to what I'm about to talk about now is somebody asks, does an open exam mean, does an open book exam mean I have access to my study material or my notes? So I'm going to actually answer your question right now as I go through this slide, okay? Here are some key facts about the CP. Everybody in Canada writes the same CP exam. So at the end of the day, keep in mind, please, that this is a national exam. It's not written, it's not different by province. Everybody writes the exact same exam. You have three attempts to pass. So if one doesn't make it the first time, it's nothing to be upset about. Some people make it the first time. Some people need a couple of tries. Vast, vast majority of people by the time they've had three attempts, have made it already. The exam is written on a computer, which I believe is different than the Indian CA. You'd be using Word for the qualitative portion of your answer, and you'd be using Excel for the quants. The exam is open book. So somebody was asking what that means. What that means is that you have access to an electronic copy of the CPA handbook. The CPA handbook basically contains the guidance on both accounting and assurance. You also have available the Tax Act. You do not have available any of your notes. All you have available is the handbook and the Tax and the Tax Act. Now, the nice thing about the CPA exam is because it's a national exam, it really doesn't matter in which Canadian province you write the exam. So you can decide there are 10 provinces in Canada. You can decide to write the exam in Ontario. And then if you get a job in Alberta, which is a different province, you move to Alberta and you don't have to write any new exam. Once you're qualified to practice in one province, you're qualified to practice across the country. Before I go on to, to my next slide, I just want to take a look. As Ira said, any questions that relate to stuff we're going to deal with later, I'm not going to answer now. So let me just quickly see if there's any questions that relate to that do not relate to what's coming up in the future. I, I, I will not address the ones that are coming up in the future. Um, in terms, in terms of the job market in Canada, if you don't mind, if we can just, if we can just wait at the very end of the presentation, if there's extra time, we can certainly we'll be happy to talk about that, okay? At the end of the day, the short answer is that the job market in general for CAs is very good. For Indian CAs, it's a little more difficult to get that first job, so you may have to take a job that's a little bit beneath you, so to speak, that might be not quite at the level you had in India, at least initially, just to get your foot in the door. But once you have Canadian job experience, and especially once you have a Canadian CA, then the sky's the limit. You know, there, there's there's fantastic opportunity available. Um, I'll just take a quick look to see if there's anything else that isn't being covered later. Um,
Okay, so you know what? I, I think, Iris, is there anything else you think we need to answer now? I think everything else, I think we can move on. Do you, does that, that make sense? Yeah, again, as I'm saying, people, we are going to, uh, I mean, I apologize because it means copying and pasting like your comment, but, you know, you guys are, are, are writing the questions. So what you might want to do is as we get onto this actual slide itself, um, copy and paste your question, and then we'll try and deal with it if we have not answered it already. So I think we should just keep going. There's a lot of questions here and they're good questions, but I think we're going to answer a lot of these. Yeah, most of them will answer, and as Ira says, if we don't, let us know, but I, but I agree. So let's continue. Well, actually, but, sorry, sorry, Michael. One person is asking, what if we don't clear in three attempts? Um, if you don't clear in three attempts, so that's a good question. Um, I'm not even sure. If you're from India and you don't clear in three attempts, can you write it a fourth time? Um, See, if you're, if you're a Canadian student, I believe what happens to the Canadian students, and maybe this might be the same if you're from India, is you would have to go back to the modules. Um, Indian students are in a different situation because people with a CA from India don't have to write the modules. So if you don't clear in three attempts, I'm not sure, Michael can comment, but it might be you have to go to the modules as if you were a Canadian student because you didn't clear in three attempts. Um, I'm not 100% certain. Yeah, I mean, I don't even, to be honest with you, I've never seen that happen yet. So hopefully that will, hopefully this will be re remain a theoretical question. But you know what? I, I don't know. It, it, they may do what Iris suggested. I don't even know if CPA Canada has an answer to that at this point. But uh, uh, to be, I, I'm really not sure. Because uh, as Iris says, with Canadian students, they go back to the beginning of the program. It would make sense that they would do the same thing for Indian students. But I would not worry too much about this right now. I'm not sure this issue has even come up yet. I don't even know if there's been a situation yet where an Indian student has failed three times. And one of um, one of the things also that changed people, one of the reasons it may not have come up yet is the idea that you guys are exempt from Capstone 1 and 2 only started last year in 2019. So we haven't even had three years of Indian students being exempt from Capstone 1 and 2. So the situation was in flux. It was only the MOU in January 1, 2019 where you have that exemption. So uh, it, it's hard to know if you failed three times. People, Indian students could write before, but they had to go to Capstone 1 and 2. So the situation is a bit changing, so I'm not sure. And, and by the way, j just before I move on, I noticed one student wrote to us, in India, we have unlimited attempts. Keep in <laughs> mind, in India, you need unlimited attempts because the pass rate is so low, right? It's from what my Indian students tell me, uh, you know, you can have an 11% pass rate. Keep in mind in Canada, for first time writers, I'm not talking about Indian CPAs, Indian CA specifically, but for the overall population writing, the pass rate can be 75%. So you don't really need the unlimited attempts. Um, they used to put out uh, statistics and for people who write three times, the percentage, I'm guessing now, the percentage that get through is well into the 90s. So that's why there isn't a huge need for unlimited attempts, as opposed to India where you're working with a much lower pass rate. So, so let's take a look now at part two of the presentation. Part two of the presentation, we're going to deal with studying for the exam. I mentioned earlier that this is a case-based exam. So you have to become very adept at case writing, but you also need to know your technical. So let's take a look at this. Case writing is essential, guys. Uh, the earlier you start writing cases, the better. The bottom line is writing cases is not rocket science. And I believe that anybody who's intelligent enough to get their Indian CA, which I know is extremely difficult, is certainly intelligent enough to learn how to write cases. However, having said that, it does take a long time. There's a new mindset that you need to develop. And for many people, it takes them a number of months until they start to feel comfortable with case writing. So it's not at all unusual for people to study a year. Some people even take one and a half years. Most, we find that the vast majority of people do not take more than a year, but some people take a little longer, which is, which is perfectly fine. How long you're going to need to study, Ira will address in more detail later on. Part of it will be a function of whether you're working or not while you're studying. Most students are working while they're studying, and therefore that's why they need quite a bit of time. There are a small number of students who are not working, and they can do it a little bit more quickly. But the exam is certainly designed for people who are working, which we find works very well for Indian students who usually are more mature and are ready at a stage in life where they need to be working to, to support themselves and their families. 
Now, no, unlike the CA in India, which is, from what I understand, a non-case-based exam for the most part, students in Canada are preparing for case writing right from the beginning of the process. So simultaneous with your technical studying, you'll be writing cases. It's not like you study all of your technical, and then when you're finished your technical, you begin practicing your cases. While you're studying your technical, you're writing cases, and you're learning a lot of your technical from your case writing. Now, the two biggest areas to focus on from a technical perspective are financial accounting and management accounting. Those, as I mentioned earlier, are the most heavily tested areas on the CV. For financial accounting, in Canada, we actually use IFRS primarily for public companies, and ASPE primarily, ASPE is used only for private companies. IFRS, many of you are familiar with. ASPE is accounting standards for private enterprises. It was developed in Canada. ASPE, you're not going to be familiar with coming with an Indian CA. But again, we will teach you ASPE as part of the past course. We recognize that there's no reason why anybody outside of Canada would be familiar with ASPE. The nice thing about management accounting is there's a great deal less technical to know. And management accounting is, of course, the same worldwide. Now, one area that's going to be new for Indian CAs is tax. Obviously, the Tax Act in Canada will be obviously very different from whatever tax code is used in India. Ira and I are obviously not, not intimately familiar with Indian taxation. The good news about tax, though, is that unless you choose tax as your role on day two of the CP, and very few Indian CAs do so, there's the odd Indian CA who's been in Canada for a number of years and working in tax who chooses it, but 98% Indian CAs do not choose tax as their role. So as long as you don't choose tax as your role, you will only have to address tax at a technical level on day three of the CP. And on day three of the CP, they will not test tax in a great deal at a very high level at all. You need to know the basic compliance. They will not test very much in the way of tax planning. Anything involving tax planning or anything complex is beyond the scope of day three. It's only tested on day two. And as I said before, very few Indian CAs will deal with tax on day two. At the end of the day, in a di you've got to be comfortable with compliance. You've got to be comfortable with how to compute taxable income, both for an individual and for a corporation. You need to know what's deductible, what isn't deductible. Again, we will give you material to work with so that you can get your tax up to speed. Because you don't need to know it at a terribly high level, it's very doable, even though you have not studied tax in Canada. What about the other competencies? The other three competencies are assurance. Uh, Iris says, it says audit here, but basically audit encompasses all of assurance, finance, and governance. When it comes to assurance, um, a large part of it is going to be fairly intuitive. You know, when it comes to planning an audit or a review, when it comes to procedures, uh, all of that, when it comes to analyzing control weaknesses, that's going to be the same across the world. And to a large degree, it's going to be intuitive. And you're going to learn a lot of that just from writing cases. There is some technical you'll have to learn separate from the cases, like the reporting. Reporting in Canada will certainly be different than in India. But a large part of assurance you will learn from writing cases. And a large part of it will become intuitive. Finance is not tested at a very high level at all on this exam. So you'll learn a lot of your finance from writing cases. We'll also give you material to work with, but you won't need to spend a huge amount of time on finance because it's not tested at a very high level. And then the last competency is strategy and governance. Strategy and governance is 100% common sense on the CP. So very little in the way of technical studying. 99% of your preparation for strategy and governance will come through practice case writing. I'm now going to pass over the floor to, to Ira, and Ira will, will describe the program that PASS designed specifically for Indian and other international CAs. Okay, so just give me a sec. I think they're passing the, I'm going to now be the instructor. Just give me one sec, guys. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm hoping you guys can see. Michael, you can see my PowerPoint, correct? Yeah, yes, I can. 
Okay, um, perfect. Should, should we just take a quick look to see if there are any questions that, that relate to, to things I've gone over as opposed to things that are coming up? Because, or have you read yeah, so, them, Ira? Yeah, no. So you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch McCall it. I'll keep going. And Michael, you, maybe you watch the questions. And if there's something on the particular slide I'm dealing with, just interrupt me. Right, right. But you want to take a moment now just to see if there's any questions that I, we didn't, sure. that we didn't okay. see ba based on what I just went over. I, I'm not going to even read the ones that relate to what's coming up because you'll deal with them later. Oh, okay. So somebody asks, can you please speak about uh, tax on day two in detail? As I'm an Indian state with post qualification experience of three years in tax. On the truth is that on day two, if you do choose tax as your as your depth area because you have experience with it, day two it's tested in more depth. There's a lot of tax planning involved. Um, although even on day two. Um, it's not at that high a level. Um, I don't know if you were planning to do the in-depth tax course. It would be well below the level of the in-depth tax course that tax specialists in Canada do. But the main difference is you'll be dealing with more complex situations and you'll be dealing with a lot more tax planning. Okay. Uh, let me just take a look if there's anything else dealing with the stuff that I went over. Um, Will you get access to Will you get access to Notion the exam? The answer is yes. The exam. I think Michael said this. The exam is open book, so you will have access to the handbook and the tax act. The tax act is basically useless, but the handbook, um, the handbook is definitely useful. So the answer is yes. How are marks given for case study? People are not really going to go into today to the whole marking scheme. The the marking scheme is a little more complicated, and you really need to see a whole case. So we do that as one of the, as really almost the very first class in the whole course uh, that we offer. But we're not going to go into the whole marking scheme. It's not so relevant, to be honest, at, at this stage. And if you're taking, if you're taking the course and you're in the course, then we'll tell you right at the very beginning how the exam day two and day three actually get marked. It's a whole marking profile. It takes 15 minutes to go through. Um, It's not necessary. Someone is asking, is it necessary to take tax as a depth area if you want to pursue a tax career? It would make sense. Is it necessary? No, it's not necessary. You don't have to take tax as your role. Tax as, your role. as I think I said before, um, no one is really going to ask you down the road. Uh, you could decide not to take tax as your role, and then you could decide a year later that you want to go into tax. Of course, you can still go into tax. The two are not really related, to be honest. If you're very good in tax and you're practicing tax in India and you like tax, it's, you know, then I don't know if, if when you start to see Canadian tax, if you think you're going to be good at that on the exam, then it could make sense to do it. Very few Indian students do that because it's totally new and foreign to an Indian student. But it does not impact, again, your job or anything down the road. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and somebody asks, what is the handbook? The handbook, as I mentioned before, Describe it basically has the guidance or the rules both for financial accounting as well as assurance. Okay. In terms of when to start, Ira will deal with that later. Um, uh, okay. Do you want, maybe maybe you should move on, Ira. I'll keep going. Okay. So people look again. I, I know a lot of these questions. The truth is, we are going to cover. Um, so again, if you have to re-ask your question, if we miss it, do me a favor, just copy and paste it in and we'll answer it. Yeah. And if I oh. could just add, add one quick point before you start, Ira. Um, you know, given that we have so many people in this session, which, which we're very delighted about, um, unfortunately, we will miss some questions. It's in inevitable. So if for some reason by the end of the session, we haven't answered your question, we do have contact information, which we're providing our emails. So if we don't end up answering your question, please just email us after the session and we'll certainly get back to you, okay? Because I'll apologize in advance that we just might not get to every question, but if you email us afterwards, we can answer your questions. Okay, so just to give you a brief background, I guess, about who we are. So we've been doing this for a long time, um, as, as you can see. Uh, we've offered these courses within all of the large, all of the large firms. Um, currently, we, we actually run the uh, PwC program uh, Pricewaterhouse across um, Canada um, and Michael you can see here did very well um, when he actually wrote the um, uh, CFI in those days was called the UFI he was actually a gold medalist all right so we really do three things to help train students 
We offer technical training, case writing, and we have personal counseling. Personal counseling means a marker will mark your case and then we'll go over it with you personally, um, probably on WhatsApp or Skype or Zoom um, or, or any other, doesn't really matter. Um, but the marker will go over it with you um, and show you what you did right and what you did wrong. This is kind of the overall picture, um, basically. So part of this is self-study and part of it is what we call formal, formal instruction. So essentially what happens is when you register for the course, we would be giving you a technical binder and we'd be giving you access to technical videos and you would start to read the binder, watch the videos and start to study the technical because you need a technical base of knowledge, kind of what Michael described before. You have to be up on Canadian tax. You have to learn ASPE for financial accounting. You need a basic technical knowledge. So you start to study your technical. And then you get into case writing. An important point that is different than what you guys do in India is that you get into case writing before you finish all of the technical. It doesn't have to be the same day you start to write technical, you start to study technical that you write a case. But I want to be very clear, you do not finish all the technical before you start case writing. It is more a combined approach because you're picking up some of the technical through the case writing. So it's really a combined, it's really a combined approach. When exactly you start case writing, okay, again, that depends on how long you're starting, to be honest before the actual exam is coming up. Obviously, if you start earlier, if you start earlier and have more time, then you could spend more time doing technical before you get into case writing. But if you start much later, you will have to get into case writing sooner because you need more practice on the cases. Okay. So, um, I just commented on a few of these points. The technical study binder, the videos I just mentioned. Um, Financial, financial accounting, I think really Michael, Michael has said this. So I'll talk about afterwards about how we, do, how we do our sessions. It says here a combination of live sessions and videos. So actually maybe I'll address, I'll address it now. So we have all of our sessions we do live online similar to what you're experiencing now. Okay, we use a different platform. We use something called WebEx, but it's essentially the same thing. So all of the sessions are really... Um, well, almost all of the sessions are really live online sessions where they're actual classes. We always record the sessions, so you can always watch a session if you miss it. Right now, we are not doing any live online sessions for people in India. If we have enough students from India, then we could do, we probably would do live online sessions where it would work out from a timing perspective. So right now, it doesn't work out because our live online sessions are in the evening. Canadian time, which would be nine and a half hours later, unless you get up very early in the morning at 4.30 a.m. approximately, okay, you would not be able to go in live to the session. You could, but you'd have to get up very early. If we have enough students, we would definitely do it live online for students in India. So financial accounting, we have a whole bunch of live online sessions. For management accounting, the technical, we have a whole bunch of live online sessions. Everything is in video. For some of the smaller areas, as Michael was saying before, we don't actually have live online. You would watch the video, like for audit or governance, okay? But for financial accounting and management accounting, we would have live online sessions at the moment, Canadian time in the evening, and down the road, it could be for on Indian time, IST time as well. Okay, but we have videos, again, we have videos on everything. Case writing. So we have two parts. Michael, you want to interrupt? If I can just mention for a moment, a moment because somebody's asking somebody's a question relating to one of your slides. Um, um, they want to know how many of you are given, are given class funds. Um, the answer is that you can view the videos as often as you like. So basically what we do is we give you access to the videos of all of the classes. You continue to have access until you pass the exam. There's no limit to the number of times you can watch the videos. Um, we will be giving you the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I believe you're going to be sent the PowerPoint presentation from today's session. Case writing. Um, we give you practice exams 
where you will self mark. Not everybody gets to those. Once again, it depends how much time you have. So if you started today for a year, September, September 2021, you probably would have time for practice exams. If you started today for September 2020, this September, you probably would not have time for practice exams. I'll talk about timing in a few minutes, but I'm just explaining the self study where it says write and self mark cases. The formal instruction that you do need to have time for is you will have practice cases for all three days. For all three days, you will be writing practice cases for the day one case, for the day two comp, the one case for five hours, and for the day three, what we call multis, you'll be writing practice cases throughout. In addition to teaching the case writing, just have a quick look at this. I'm not going to go into detail. We do have sessions. We call these technique sessions. They're not actually case writing. We're simply teaching. We're teaching, we're teaching certain techniques we want you to use when you write cases. It will make case writing easier. So we teach numerical methods. Michael does, does a session um, on how to crunch numbers quicker. We have depth in financial accounting. Financial accounting, Michael mentioned, is one of the two biggest areas. So how do you get depth in financial accounting? So these are called technique sessions. I'm just explaining we have other sessions besides case writing where that are important to help you when you're writing the cases. The personal counseling, I think I've already explained it. We give Indian students, to be honest, more personal counseling sessions than we do for Canadian students, um, just because we know you're coming from a different system. So meeting with a marker, doesn't matter if it's, in, it's not going to be in person, for, even for people in Canada, it's not going to be in person. It's probably going to be, again, over Skype or whatever, WhatsApp, it doesn't really matter. But the whole point is they will be going over your exam with you for about half an hour. We do that three times. That's a significant amount. Canadian students get one time. Um, I don't think you really need much more than that. A lot of the instruction you need really comes through the classes when we go over the cases and we explain how to write the cases. Okay, now, people, let's talk about um, a little bit about not attending Capstone 1 and Capstone 2. Um, you guys know you are exempt beginning from January 1, 2019. You do not have to take Capstone 1 and 2. In September 2019, that was our first experience for everybody, for Indian CAs writing September 2019, the CFI who did not take Capstone 1 and Capstone 2. Michael mentioned the statistics before. We don't know the overall statistics for Indian students. We know for Canadian students, the statistics are about 74% for first-time writers. We don't know for Indi we don't know for Indian students, they would never disclose it. I don't even know if they track it. Even if they do, it's not disclosed. What we do know is, a, is the people that took our course, and we were happy last year. Um, we, don't, we don't know every single person that took our course if they passed or failed, because the truth is we don't, always, we don't always get told after the fact. But a lot of people do tend to tell us, um, both good and bad, when they pass and fail. We were pretty happy last year with the results. Okay, Of the people we know about, I think the stats are probably somewhere around 60 to 65 percent of our Indian students passed. Those are the people we know about. I'm not saying that's a complete statistic. We don't know about a bunch of other people that never told us. But a lot of people got through for the first time who did not attend Capstone 1 and 2. We built something into the program to address Capstone 1 and Capstone 2, which I'll talk about, and we think it worked. So we were very happy with that. And I mean, it's all relative. Is it lower than the Canadian pass rate? Yes, it is lower than the Canadian pass rate. Is it a heck of a lot higher than the Indian pass rate? As Michael said, that's a lot better than 10 or 15%. So that's what we think happened last year, again, for the people that we know about. All right. You do have the option, by the way, of taking Capstone 1 and 2. We don't recommend you do it. I will explain why. But you do have the option of taking it. Okay, but again, we don't really recommend it. I'm only going to explain this, even though I don't recommend you take this, because, you know, we were getting some questions, by the way, what do I mean, a business case and stuff like that. So I don't think it hurts for two minutes to have an understanding of what Canadian students do 
in Capstone 1. And how are you going to deal with this by not going to Capstone 1? How are you going to write the first day of the CFI? You did not go to Capstone 1. Let's talk Canadian students, not CAs from India. Canadian students, they get put into a group in Capstone 1, four or five people. They deal online. They give a case out. The case is massive. It's like, I don't know, 30, 40 pages long. You will get the same case, CAs from India. You will all get the same case. I don't care if you're in India or Canada. You'll get the same case, okay, that they're going to get. What they do is they work for about seven Canadian students who take Capstone 1. They work in their group for seven, eight weeks online, and they are addressing the case. They are answering questions. They are emailing them in. They are getting responses back, told what they did right, what they did wrong, and they hand in a revised little report. Okay, that's what they're doing. At the end of the seven or eight weeks, when they finish Capstone 1, after back and forth with the markers, with this case, and they're working with their group, and by the way, they start with a two-day session that's actually in class. It opens, the Capstone 1 opens up with a two-day in-class session. Um, and then the rest of the time they work online. At the, end of, at the end of Capstone 1, look at the bottom three points here. They submit a written report, a very large written report on the case. And they do an oral presentation. They do an oral presentation to a board of markers, like three people or something. And they have to pass. Now, the pass is very easy. It's not difficult to pass Capstone 1. Almost everybody passes unless you do something crazy like not hand it in. So, uh, again, everybody basically passes. It's not being used to weed out people. So, that is just a description, again, of Capstone 1. I didn't explain yet exactly how you guys are going to deal with that. But that is the description of Capstone 1. We tell you, don't take it. Why? They're trying to teach Canadian students certain things you don't need for the exam. So look at the first bullet point. Group work. You don't need group work for this exam. This exam you write on your own. You're not part of a group. So we don't really care so much if you know how to work in a group. Maybe it's an important life skill, but the truth is I don't really care, or Michael doesn't really care for the exam itself. You're not working in a group. Well, Capstone One does care. Because they want to make sure that the Canadian students know how to work in a group. And similarly, presentation skills. I don't really care if you can give a presentation, an oral presentation. It is an important skill in life, maybe in work. But it's not something we are teaching you, and it's not something that shows up on the exam. This exam is written. Somebody actually had that question. Is the exam a presentation? No. The exam is three days. You're at the computer. You're writing on Word and Excel, okay, and you're answering cases. Okay, that's what you're doing on this exam. You're not doing any presentation. The other point, the second point, is a big point also. Capstone 1 takes Canadian students a lot of time. They spend 10, 15 hours a week on Capstone 1. That is not worth it. They don't have a choice. CAs from India do have a choice. So we recommend don't do it. We can, we can keep you busy. Believe me, we'll talk about time afterwards. Okay, um, a lot more productive than Capstone 1. And it's expensive, it's $1,300, whatever. And for those people sitting in India, if you did take Capstone 1, outside of the, forget about the pandemic at the moment, hopefully it won't last that much longer, but when the pandemic is basically over, if you're from India and you take Capstone 1, you will have to make two trips to Canada. You'll have to be here for the first two-day session, and you'll have to be in Canada for the presentation, for the oral presentation. So for all of those reasons, we do not recommend you take Capstone 1. Michael, I'm not even looking at the questions. Do you see any questions relating to Capstone 1 that I've not covered? Okay, Michael, you're, you're muted. Please unmute. There, I, there, are other, I, there, there are no questions on Capstone 1. There are other questions which I'll deal with later. Okay. Capstone back. 2. Okay, thank you. Capstone 2. Um, Again, same reason I want to describe this. I want to explain what it is for Canadian students and you know. I still, by the way, for Capstone 1, don't worry, I'm going to deal with afterwards how you guys prepare for it. Capstone 2, okay, 
Um, all that really is is practice exam writing. Once again, Canadian students in Capstone 2 will start with a two-day workshop in class. So once again, if you're from India and you do take it, you have to be here for those first two days. And after that, you don't work in a group. What you're doing for the next seven weeks is you're simply writing answers to practice old exam questions. That's it. You send it in, they mark it, they send it back. Okay, that is essentially capstone two. There is no pass or fail. So this is important. Again, I'll explain how we deal with this, but that is capstone two. It is essentially practice exam writing, writing old cases, sending them in, getting them marked, you get feedback, and they send them back. That is capstone two. No pass or fail. No real pass or fail. Okay, basically, I guess if you don't hand any of them in, again, it could be a problem, but it's not really a pass or fail. So we're going to provide an alternative. <clears throat> By the way, this costs $1,300 also, and but don't worry, we are going to provide an alternative, which we feel is going to be just as good, and it's going to be a lot cheaper because we build it into the whole program. Okay, so I'll explain that. Okay, Ira, before you go further, uh, Ira, before you go further, there is one question on Capstone One before you go further. Somebody sure. says they were registered in Capstone One and applied for a tourist visa to attend the two day session, but got rejected. So can they now opt out of it? You know, I, I, once you've decided to take it, I, I would think you can probably still opt out of it. But to be honest with you, that's a very difficult question for us to answer. I would strongly suggest that you communicate with the provincial institute you're dealing with and ask them if you can opt out. Hopefully they will allow you to. I would think they probably will, given that you're not required to take it, but you should speak directly with the Provincial Institute that you're dealing with. Okay, thank you. So people, here is what we're gonna do instead of Capstone One. We do not offer the exact same that they offer. We don't want to do that. Again, it's a bit of a waste of time, a lot of the stuff you end up doing for them. But we have to prepare you enough to pass day one. So what do we do? These are really the three things. Number one, in Capstone One, when they give you this big case of 30, 40 pages, on day one of the CFE, they will take the same company. They will say, as Michael said, it's five or 10 years later. You do not have to remember most of the details from the large case that the people worked on in Capstone One. You would have to remember some of the basic details about the company. So for example, what I mean by basic details, I don't know, maybe it's a private company, maybe they're owned by three brothers, maybe the three brothers have a whole bunch of fights and they don't get along. And now day one of the CFI, they use the same company owned by three brothers. And it's a new case, but it's, an, it, it's the same company, but it's a new scenario, it's five years later. You might have to remember at some point that the three brothers don't get along and that could influence the strategy the company takes. So we prepare a handout that summarizes the key information. Most of the information, 95% of the information in the Capstone One case that are given to everybody in Capstone One, you will not have to remember. But there might be 5% that is important you will have to remember. So we give you a handout. We have a class. We have a three, a th like a three hour live online session. Again, it's live. We record it. If you miss it, you just watch the recording. And we're going to mark two practice cases for Capstone One. That is very important. That is very important because they will give you when you register the Capstone One case, this 30, 40 page case. They will not give you a solution. They will only give you the case. They will not give you a solution. They don't really prepare like a whole solution to that case. So it's important to write some practice cases based on the same company, and that's what we're going to do inside the program. Capstone 2. What we're going to do is we tell all of the Indian students to purchase the Capstone 2 material. That material, you purchase it not from us. You purchase it from the um, institute, from the provincial body, from the provincial CPA. So if you're in Ontario, you buy it from Ontario. If you're in British Columbia, you buy it from British Columbia. It will cost approximately $250 Canadian dollars. 
We'll talk about fees after. It'll cost 250 Canadian dollars. And what they give you online is they will give you all the practice exam, all the practice cases for a bunch of the old CFIs. What we will then do is you will be writing and handing in for us every week, seven weeks leading up to the CFI every week, you will be writing the same case as they write in Capstone 2, but instead of handing it in to them for marking, you will be handing it in to us for marking. And we'll be marking it and sending it back to you. Included, let me go back. Number three, everyone look at number three. Included in the seven weeks will be two practice Capstone 1 cases. There will also be day two cases and day three cases, but there'll be two practice Capstone 1 cases from day one. We will do all that marking. So essentially, Capstone 2, we are kind of duplicating. We are doing Capstone 2, essentially. We build it into the course. And the reason we did that is because we want you to have more practice writing exams, and we want to give you more feedback. That is the reason. Okay? Yeah. That is how we pick off Capstone 1 and Capstone 2. I reduced I a couple of questions on Capstone 1 that you may, that students would like you to address. Um, um, one, student, one student asks, um, sorry, excuse me, um, should we not be provided with the information and only required to apply the knowledge in a, it's a fictional case, why are we supposed to remember the details from Capstone 1? You know, I think that Ira actually did address because day one is based on the Capstone One case. There are certain parts of the case that could impact the writing of day one. That's why you need to know it. Uh, that's why you need to know certain parts of the case, which we'll summarize for you. And another question was: Is Capstone One case available online? Can it be read before the CFE exam for students who decide not to write it? Um, I'm not sure what that question is. Uh, Ira, I think the student is asking: can, Will they see the complete? Capstone one case if they choose not to attend Capstone one. I think yes, that's what right. So and, people again, and the next question also. So let me address both of these questions about: Is there a new Capstone one case every year? The answer is yes. It gets a little complicated. What they do is when you register, they when you register, they will give you a choice of which Capstone one case. Every exam, there's a new Capstone one case. Um, there's a new there's a new company and a, and a Capstone one case. They give you a couple of chances on that same company. So let's say, let's pretend I write in September 2020, and I'm doing the new case for this year is called Distinct Hotels. So I sign up and I say I want to write Distinct Hotels. Yes, they will make that case available online. I will have the same case that people in Capstone One have. I will have a 30, 40 page case on called Distinct Hotels about something, I don't know, it's a hotel company, okay? I will have that. I will write my CV in September based on Distinct Hotels and they will give me a new, a new case based on Distinct Hotels on the actual exam itself on day one. Fine. If I'm unsuccessful, the next time I write, I will be allowed to write another Capstone One day one case on distinct hotels. But other people writing the same exam, let's say I write in May of 2021, I'm writing a second time. Day one, I will be answering a question based on distinct hotels, and the person sitting next to me writing for the first time will write the new question for May called waste management. Okay? Truthfully, I could also write waste management if I told them I want to write that. They don't really care. I could do that, but most people won't. Most people are unsuccessful. You've already studied a little bit of distinct hotels. You're going to write that one a second time, usually. Okay? So that is how this works. So at every exam sitting, there, there's there's half the, half the people, not half, but whatever, a portion of the people are writing uh, the one from last time, and a portion of the people are writing the new case. That is basically how it works, but everybody, you're always given the you're always given the case. Yeah, and somebody or somebody asks also, uh, you know, when they make the choice, do they make the choice when they register for the CFE? You'll be asked well before you register for the CFE which case you want to write for day one. That that choice will be given to you before you even register for the CFE. And as Ira points out, it's usually a pretty easy decision. If it's your first time writing, you'll usually choose the new case. 
And if it's your second time writing, you'll choose the same case that you wrote the previous year. And I also think you can make a change, to be honest. I think you're not locked in anyway. I think you can make a change. I don't know the exact date up to what time you can make a change, but truthfully, I don't think they particularly care. And if you decided you picked one and then changed your mind, that's not going to be a problem. You can do that probably up in, until maybe a month or two before the exam. But as Michael just said, first-time writers choose distinct hotels. If there's anyone listening to this and you choose at right now who is writing this September and you chose more money, and you're a first-time writer, my money was last time, I would choose distinct hotels, I would choose the new one. Okay? All right. Um, oh, all right, sorry, one last quick question that somebody asked. I'll just address it very quickly, just take a moment. Somebody says, will you guys help us with how to claim exemption of Capstone 1 and 2? It is, there's really no need for our help. You'll just simply be asked if you want to attend or not, and you'll indicate yes or no. So there's really no, no assistance required there. It's not like you have to file some complex form. Bill, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna briefly mention this about fees. And the truth is, it's gonna come up afterwards again. But we we threw the slide in now because we're just trying to show you that. Um, I don't know if you appreciate this. You may not, but the truth is, we were very happy when they made um, under the MOU that Indian students got exempted from Capstone One and Capstone Two. That's a big deal because you save a lot of money. Again, you may not care so much about that, but the truth is, compared to Canadian students, you are saving a lot of money because we price our course, you can see the very first bullet point. We price our course at 2,375. This is Canadian dollars. In addition to that, the only other fee you would have would be the $250. There's no other fee. Our fee would include everything, like for the course, all, all the sessions, everything we're talking about. But then you'd have another $250. If you took Capstone 1 and Capstone 2, we would charge you a lower fee. We would charge you a lower fee. We would charge you $19.95 minus a 15% discount or $16.95. Okay, so one second. If you take Capstone 2 with us, if we mark all those day two uh, Capstone 2 cases, the regular program is 2375. If you say, I don't want you to mark those extra cases, maybe I want to go to Capstone 2, okay? Or you just don't want us to mark them. You want to buy the material and mark them yourself. Then we're not going to charge you 2375. The charge will be 1695. We're only charging the 2375 because we're marking a lot more cases. Of course, if you go to Capstone 1 and 2, we will charge you 1695, but then you'll end up paying about 4295 because Capstone 1 and 2 are about $1,300 each. So obviously, that's more expensive. But you could not go to Capstone 1 and 2, not have us mark the cases, those extra cases, and the fee would be 1695. And yes, by the way, to forestall the question, we will still be marking cases in the program. We have our cases that we have written that you will be writing and, and will be marking. Nothing to do with Capstone 2. But we won't be marking as many. Most people, I'll tell you very honestly, 95%, I don't know what the percentage is, is really high, choose the 2375 because it's cheaper and they want us to give them the feedback. But there are a few every year, maybe for financial reasons, Okay, we'll talk about that afterwards. We try and do our best for, again, I'll talk about that after. But most people, watch my call it, um, do choose the 2375 because it's part of the whole cost for the whole thing and they want to get the feedback. Okay, and they want to get the feedback where their cases are marked by professional markers. Okay, but you don't have to. We do have another alternative at the 1695. Okay, I don't know if Michael sees anything here. All right, um, I think I've covered a lot of this. Technical binder, so study, right cases monthly. Okay, fine. This is a quick summary. Okay, right prior cases. I've got nothing there. Yeah, Ira, before, um, before you go oh. further, if you can just go back to the previous slide, please. Uh, I've been keeping track of some questions people had, and I was waiting for that slide. If you just go one more slide, please. Sure, Michael, talk, yeah. please, right into the mic. Uh, Ira, if you can just go one more slide. Yeah, back. I got it. Okay. No, no further. Yeah. Go, go, go ahead, one slide, please. Uh, no, to the summary slide, please. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so just there were a few questions I was keeping track of. I didn't want to interrupt you, and I thought this would be a good juncture to answer them. Um, one of the questions we had were about videos. Um, are the videos available for all sessions or, or just certain sessions? The videos are available for 100% of the sessions, um, whether it's case writing, whether it's any of the technical studying for any of the six competencies, for 100% of the sessions, you will you will have avail you will have videos available. Um, in term in terms of the sessions, somebody asked about the duration of the sessions. The duration of the sessions really varies. Some sessions could just be two hours. Some sessions could be a full day. It really depends on the session itself. Ira will go over the number of sessions just a little bit later. Um, Ira mentions that you know you're going to be writing cases which you'll be handing in. Um, somebody asked about evaluation of the cases. You'll be getting constant evaluation of your cases, uh, markers. Every you'll be writing many, many cases. I think Ira, you, you said about twenty cases in total that will be professionally not marked. Yet. Uh, sorry. Yeah, not yet. It will, it will come up. Go ahead. Okay. That, but the bottom line is, you'll be writing many, many cases, and the cases will all be evaluated professionally. So you will. So if some, somebody was asking, will they know where they stand? You'll have a pretty good idea of how you're doing. Um, basic, basically. Uh, because of the fact that um, you will be getting constant evaluation of your cases. Somebody also asked, while in India, are videos available for all classes? It doesn't really matter where you are, whether you're in India or Canada, all videos will be available to you. Uh, so it doesn't really matter uh, where, where you are. Uh, and the last question, which, which again, I apologize, I didn't answer while Ira was dealing with Capstone, was whether the Capstone cases are industry specific the answer is they try very hard not to be very, not to be industry specific because they don't want to give an advantage to students who have who happen to have worked in a particular industry. You do not have to have any particular knowledge of any industry. Okay, so you, it's okay. not like you have to be from a certain industry, not at all. No, for any of this entire exam, you do not have to have any specific industry knowledge really for anything. Yeah. And the last question I just want to answer, because I don't think Ira will be getting to that later. It wasn't really in our slide, so I'll answer it now, is somebody was asking about experience requirements. Um, the bottom line is, if you, don't have an, if you don't have a university degree, you would need to have five-year post-qualification experience, post-qualification in India. If you have a university degree, which I believe many of you do, you just have to have two years of post-qualification experience. If you have these, if you meet these requirements, there'll be no assessment of your work experience. If you don't meet these requirements, then they will assess your work experience. The worst that can happen, though, is they may ask, they may not give you your CPA until you gain enough work experience. Uh, you, somebody had asked whether you would need special training. You wouldn't need special training. In the worst scenario, you would just have to get further experience before you officially get granted the CPA designation. That's and we think people, again, we do not make this determination. This is done from CPA. So what you do is you provide them with your details of experience. And what we hear is that it's not very difficult once you really have worked, it's not very difficult to meet this criteria at all. Um, you just explained as much as you can about all of your work experience and they take that. Nobody's gonna go check out uh, the company you worked for in India. So that is not a very difficult thing. We again do not really get involved in that. Our job is to get you to pass the exam, but it's something you'd be dealing with the Institute on. But you know, we do not hear this is really a problem. Um, rarely comes up, rarely ever comes up as a problem. Okay, um, so we do actually offer people, I mean, right now they're on hold, but we do actually offer in-class sessions in Toronto um, for a number of the sessions. We do not do it for all of them. Right now, we're not doing it, of course, because of the whole virus COVID situation. So um, we do that as well. So some of the cases, some of the classes are actually offered twice. We will offer in normal times the same class in class, okay, in Toronto, in Toronto only, and we'll also offer it live online. Right now we're not doing the in class. Um, so again, live online we do for everything. Videos we do for everything. Okay, but the in class, we definitely have in class sessions. Uh, but again, that would be for people who are actually in, in Toronto. And as look at the last point, we were very, very flexible. 
in, in all of these in the videos and, and, and the classes. You, you, can, you can go to whatever you want. We don't have to necessarily know before you go. If you're in Toronto and you want to go to an in-class and do a live online, that's perfectly fine. You will have videos for as long as you need them. There is no maximum. Uh, there is no maximum. We don't cut you off on the videos. Our job is to get you to pass. So we're trying to make it as flexible as possible. All right, before you go on, as somebody had a question about when the classes, the live classes are offered, uh, they're offered outside of business hours. So if you're if you're working, we realize most people are working. So all of our online live sessions are all offered outside of normal business hours, either in based on Canadian time, either in the evening or on weekends. So there's no need to miss work to attend the live sessions. And for those people in India, if we have enough, if we have enough people from India taking it, then we would consider offering a, a bunch of the live online classes when it would be available for people in India. Uh, so we'd offer them, I guess, in the morning um, Canadian time, which would be the evening for Indian time. Yeah. Well, one, one last question, Ari, which I don't think we were going to address, so I should read it. Um, can somebody ask, can we do it on the phone or on, their, on, a, or on a laptop, the actual sessions themselves? Is it, it says over here, can we do it on a phone as well as a laptop? Is it available over any application or web-based link will be provided for the session? I think the answer is yes. I think you could do it. I think for WebEx, right, people right now, the platform we are using is WebEx. We're not using the same platform you're on right now. We're using WebEx at the moment. Um, so I believe under WebEx, I think you do have an option of going in under the phone, um, of going in based on the phone or on your computer. Okay, we, it's very similar to what we're doing here. We basically send you a link and, and I don't know, Zoom has become extremely popular. I don't know, we'll see. But the bottom line is yes, I think the answer is you would be able to go in um, to actually watch a live online class on your phone um, or on your computer. And, and, and you can use any browser you like. It doesn't matter whether you want to use Chrome, Firefox, any browser should pretty much, any of the major browsers should work. Um, even though you, I, I, I believe I was right that you can probably do it on your phone, I don't recommend you do so just because we're going to be showing slides. And when we're going through slides, it'll be a lot easier to see it on the laptop than on the phone. But uh, if you don't have a choice, I think the phone will work. Okay. So, people, now let's talk about timing uh, with respect to the past schedules and things like that. So, if you go to our website, Pastor CPA, we have a lot of different schedules. Um, I know sometimes people get a little bit confused because we do have a lot of schedules, but it really is not it really is not that complicated. Right now, the upcoming CFE is in September 2020. There are supposed to be one in May of 2021 and one in September of 2021. Historically, this exam was written once a year. They're now moving to twice a year. May and September. It was supposed to be written in May of 2020, but it got canceled because of the COVID. So this year it's only written again one, one time. But on a go ahead basis, it's supposed to be written twice, May and September. We have for September two versions of the course, version one, version two. The only difference is if you're writing in September, version one You'd be writing a number of cases earlier in January, February, and March. And version two, you'd be writing those same cases in the summer leading up to September. So if you register for the course, it will give you a choice. Do I choose version one or version two? We prefer version one because we think it's advantageous for you to write the cases earlier. So if you're registering for September and it's January 1st, we would say register for version one so you can write those three exams earlier in January, February, March. But if you don't, you can still write them in the summer and that would be version two. For May, we do not have version one and version two. We just have basically everybody's writing really all at the same time. It's not such a big deal. We recommend version one. The key point here is that we recommend version one just because we think it's better for you to write the cases earlier. You're not locked in. Okay, you can always switch. Okay, this is our course. So again, we're very flexible. 
I'm just explaining if you go to the website and you see version one, version two, and you get confused, that's the answer to the um that's the answer to the question. Okay. Okay, Ira, before you go further, there's a question somebody asked which we should address. Somebody asks, how is the past course different from Densmore's course? Um, as you can imagine, for professional reasons, we don't usually like to get into detail on other people's courses, given that uh, you know we don't have expertise on every detail of someone else's course. But what we can tell you is what we think is unique about the past course, and I think this is that we, to the best of our knowledge, we are the only entity that provides a course specifically designed for Indian and other international CAs that looks after all of your needs. Densmore's courses are very good, but to the best of my knowledge, and you can check this out for yourself if you wish, to the best of my knowledge, uh, he doesn't offer a course specifically catering to the needs of interna Indian and international CAs. People, one thing we did, just so you understand the history of this, is we probably were kind of first into the Indian market. And we realized, not immediately, but maybe after the first year, that people from India need a little more because you're not coming from a case-based system. So what we did is we put in a ton of stuff into our program. So if you're asking what the difference is, quite frankly, that is probably one of the biggest differences. We just give a lot more um, of everything. Okay, because we kept adding stuff because we, you know, our goal is to make you pass. Okay, quite frankly, you know, you can pay us money, but at the end of the day, if you go and take a course and, and you pay money and nobody is getting through the exam, okay, I'm not going to feel good. You're not going to feel good. That's not smart. So we took everything we give to Canadian students, put it into kind of one program for Indian students, and even more, added a few things, and came up with this whole program. So it's very doable. I saw the question a few times. People are asking how long and all this. The program is made for when people are working. You don't need to take time off necessarily when you write this exam. It is made for people working. It's not the same necessarily for everybody here that went in the Indian system. Maybe you took off three, six months. But time is very important. The earlier you start, the better. The more time you have, the better. But yes, if you're working 10, 15 hours a week, I know that was one of the questions that came up earlier. 10, 15 hours a week of study is good. But if you start unbelievably late, by late I mean, I don't know, in May for September, okay, or, or, or June for September, no way you're going to be able to do it in 10, 15 hours a week. You'll have to not be working. So it depends how long you're starting. But the program is significant and it's big, and that would be probably one of the differences is we just give much more of everything. Okay, um, here's our schedules. People, we're just showing you here version one, version two for September, for September live online in class, which again, these are just different schedules. You can go on our website. Again, you could look at this and then go to the website if you want to actually see them. For May, as I said to you, there's only one schedule um, because we don't do version one, version two. We just have like the one schedule and that's a live online schedule. All right, before you go further. Um, in case anybody's one, I, I think we've had a question on this, so I'll answer it now. You don't need to be copying these links. Um, you will be provided following this session with a copy of the PowerPoint. You'll also be getting a copy of the video. So at the end of the day, don't worry about copying these links. You'll have the PowerPoint, and you can then just uh, access these links. Thank you, Michael. Okay, students living in Canada, whatever. So, so again, on our system, you can see when you go to all the schedules, there'll be a schedule for a, a person living in Canada with an Indian CA, and there'll be a person not living in Canada. Okay, there'll be a separate schedule. Okay, so for example, May 2021, students living in India, here's a schedule you would look at. Again, you will see all these links. You'll get the PowerPoint presentations, Michael just said. Okay. Now, to get very specific about when you can start, and I saw a question there which we didn't address yet about starting now. Okay, so people look. Um, for the May exam, when the exam is written in May, I think probably, you know, January 1 is probably the latest you really want to start studying. Better to start studying way before that. For September, people, I, we purposely put question marks. So look. If somebody wants to know, can I write this coming September? Number one, if you have not registered 
as a student, the answer is no, it is too late to write for this September. Number two, if you are registered as a student, is when it too late? When Iris says registered as a student, he means registered with a provincial CPA institute. Thank you. To register, actually, so let me just ask some people to register with the provincial institute. The timeline is a little different depending on where you are in the country. Ontario is about 12 weeks. They will take 12 weeks from start to finish. That has really nothing to do with our course because you should be starting our course well before you get registered. It doesn't really matter. Why would you waste all that time? If you're out west in British Columbia, one of the other provinces, they may do it quicker. But they do take time to register you. They're not that fast. So if you have not registered, if you're not even started the process, then no, you cannot write this September. If you have started the process and you are registered for this September, but you have not started studying yet, look, if you're not working, you can probably do it. And you really tell me you're going you're gonna to work on this. You know, I don't know if it's be full time, but let's say, I don't know, 50% time and you're not working and you're starting now. Okay, when we're delivering this lecture, okay, May 10th or whatever, okay, between now and September, do you have enough time and you're not working? Then I think the answer would be yes. But you got to start, like, it's late, okay? It is very late, people. You'd have to start right now. But if you say to me, I'm working, I'm working full time, can I start now for September? I would be much happier if you waited till May. The odds of passing in September will not be as high. Um, I the reality, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. People, look, the reality is that you need time. Time is important. We have created a program that we think works. Okay. But, and this is a big but, you have to do it. We cannot write the cases for you. So we try, we send emails, we tell people to write the cases. But at the end of the day, if you write half the cases because you're too busy working, your odds of passing are lower. <clears throat> it's not uncommon. You know, we see people over the years, uh, a, a person from India, and th they failed the first time, and now they're in our office. They may not even, I don't know, that let's, let's say they took our course, and they failed the first time, and I start asking questions. Did you write all the exams? Did you write all the exams we gave you? I don't know. I'm not keeping track. Okay, it's a little crazy for me to keep track of every single person. You guys are mature enough at this point in your careers that we, we tell you to write. We give you the instructions. We give you the case. We give you the solution. We have markers lined up. We do all of that. You got to write it. So if you don't write it, I ask that question. A lot of times people will say to me, oh, I was going to write them. I got really busy at work. It got crazy. There was a lot to do. So I know you gave me four cases. I wrote two. That becomes a problem. So, you know, if you follow the program, your chances are much higher. But starting now for September is very difficult. It is late. It is not our preference. In special circumstances, if you say to me, I'm not working and I'm really going to do this properly, I'm going to do it half time, I'm going to do it at least 50% of my time between now and September. Doesn't even, I don't even know if it has to be 100% full time. Um, yes then I think you have a good shot and we can get you started. And um, yeah, obviously we'll have to speak to you and I'll tell you exactly what you have to do. But then I, I think the answer would be yes. Yeah, but I if you're working, I think the answer is go to, go, go at least till next May or the following September. Just to yes. up, Iris, somebody asked, you know, if they are writing in September of 020. And again, as Ira points out, it would only make sense in exceptional situations. If you fall into that situation, somebody asked whether to choose version one or version two, please choose version two. At this, if you're only starting the course now, it's too late for version one, choose version two. Someone else asked, I've started the registration process and pending confirmation from Ontario, does it make sense to join the class of September 2020? So again, if you're, if you're working right now, it's too, it really is too late to start studying now anyhow. The chance of your passing, extremely unlikely. If you're not working, and you think you think you'll have enough time to study. Uh, the only thing I would suggest you do is communicate with CPA Ontario and just make sure that they're going to finish dealing with your application before you have to register for the CP. 
So just be careful about that if your registration process is still pending to make sure that to make sure to communicate with CPA Ontario, make sure they'll complete the process in time for you to register for the CPA. Please go on. Yeah. See, people, if we were in person now, I would ask you, whoever that person was that asked that question, when did you start the process with Ontario? Because, you know, if you started in January, then the odds are good that that would be, you know, that, that you'll be okay, or even maybe February. But if you started like in April, then the odds are not good, okay, that you'll be able to write in September because they do take this 12 weeks. So in the past, this is a little bit informal, people. This is not exactly 100% black and white. It's not a science. But in the past, they, you know, they kind of had an internal date, I think, where if you got your application in in time, um, they would ultimately let you write for that CFI. But if you got the application in after, they wouldn't. So what I always tell students, and I don't know if Michael uh, tells them exactly the same, but I always tell students, and this will affect most people probably listening to this, assuming you're not writing this September. For May, when should you start the process? I would start the process some point in the fall. Anytime, I don't know, August, September, something like that, I would start the process for May. Okay? That will involve paying a student fee for the last half of the year from uh, July 1 to, to um, December 31. The problem is if you want to write in May, you start the process in January, it's too late. If you're writing in September, you can probably start the process. Yeah, early January is no problem. And then you'll only start paying your student fee from Jan 1. So you won't pay anything extra. You could also start earlier. You could register now, okay, for next May. But you'll have to pay a student fee for half the year from July. Or actually, if you start now, it's even worse. You'll have to pay more because it's before the, the, the student fee is divided up between January and June and July 1 to December. So I would not register now for May. You could start our program absolutely now. You do not have to be registered, people. This is not an issue. It's not very difficult. As long as you really have an Indian CA, just so everybody understands, I rarely, rarely hear of a student who had a problem, they registered for our program, and then they could not write the CFI, and they have to drop out. First of all, if that happens, we'd refund your money anyway, okay? But that is so unbelievably rare. If you have an Indian CA, there's not going to be a problem. It's just time-consuming. So everybody, almost everybody starts our program before they're totally registered with the institute, the provincial institute doesn't matter, okay? We don't really care, and why would you waste all that time? Okay? All right. So, people, look, I'm not going to read out the testimonials. The bottom line is go to the website, look under, um, I've got to remember which thing, look under one of the drop-down menus. I think it's the first one, About Us or something. If you look under that drop-down menu, we have a whole ton of testimonials from Indian students, and, um, you know, we try and bold what we think are the important things that basically um, the study material, all the ones I'm showing you here are from Indian students, okay, with an Indian CA. I'm not even, we have lots of Canadian ones also on the website, but obviously I'm just focusing now on the ones from, Indi on the ones from Indian students. Okay, we have a customized study process, whatever, the binders, the personal feedback, um, stuff like that. We're just trying to emphasize different, different things. Um, different things that Indian students have, have clued into. Okay, here's one, for example, first attempt. I believe this was last year. Um, okay, so again, you guys can see the testimonials. I don't really have to read out the testimonials. Um, all right, how you register is you register online. We have, we have a couple of just two different options if you're in Canada or if you're in India. Okay, you just scroll to the bottom of each of these pages and you can register. And as I keep saying, look at the last point on the slide. You're not required to be registered with CPA Ontario or any provincial institute, doesn't matter which, excuse me, before registering for pass. Once you register, to be very specific, we will send you a hard copy technical binder. You'll have immediate access to the videos. If you're in India, you'll see in a minute we have a partner in India called Orbit Institutes. You will get the hard copy binder. There may be a delay because of the pandemic. If there is, I will send you online material so you can start right away. We will also send you the second point, practice cases to write and self-mark. 
you will first watch an introduction to case writing, a few videos. You won't immediately start writing the cases. You'll watch introduction to case writing, and then you will start writing the cases. And as I said before, you, you're not going to do that immediately. You'll first start studying the technical. When you feel a little more comfortable, before you finish studying all the technical, because that will take too long, but when you feel a little more comfortable, you'll get into case writing. And then, depending on which exam you're writing, we will start the formal portion of the program where you will write the cases and hand them in for marking. So, people, if you're writing this September, obviously that's already started. I need, I need to speak to you, and of course you'll be handing them in pretty soon, very quickly. If you're writing in May, that will start in November. If you're writing next September, that will start in January. So depend the formal program starts, you know, at different times, obviously, for which exam you're writing. People also, very important point. What happens if you decide you want to write for this September and then you change your mind? There's no additional fee. We can deal with that. Okay, this definitely happens. We just move you into the next batch. I will speak to you or Michael will speak to you. We revise your study plan a little bit and you keep going. So we're very flexible. The only thing you have to be careful of from a, from a fee perspective is if you signed up to write this CFI and then you want to change to next CFI, the Institute, not us, but the Institute will charge you a fee depending on when you tell them you're canceling for this year. It's a sliding scale. They may charge you 25% of the fee for the CFI. The CFI is about fourteen or $1,500 Canadian. Yeah. 1500 yes. $1,500. They may charge you, whatchamacallit, they may charge you 25%, depending on when you tell them. And if you tell them much later, they may charge you 50% or 75%. That is to them. That is not to us. We just move you in the system and we keep going. Okay? Yeah. So there's no additional okay. fees or anything like that. And by uh, the way... Can... Oh. I'm sorry. Before, gonna... you move, before you move on, um, somebody asked, what's the last date for registering to write the CP in 020, the registration period is from May 13th to June 1st. So you have until June 1st to register for the CP. Assuming you're already a member of CPA of a provincial institute, you have until June 1st to register for the CP. Okay. So I think I saw one of the, one, someone. Someone I think had a question um, relating relating to the fees. So I've already mentioned the fees basically. So the fees are the twenty three seventy five in Canadian. Um, it is discounted fifteen. It is discounted fifteen percent. Um, the two hundred fifty dollars you don't pay to us. You pay again to the provincial institute. If you're in Ontario, you you, uh, you pay them. If you're in British Columbia, you pay them. Wherever you are in Canada, you pay them for that capstone two material. Okay, we take credit cards, that's not a problem. Um, for people that have financial need, we will do installment options, you need to speak to us, and we are flexible in installment options for people that are in financial need. Um, if the thing is just way too expensive, and you don't want us to mark Capstone 1 and 2, you can go with the 1695 option. Okay, you can go with that option, and then I would still recommend, strongly recommend, that you buy the $250 in addition to that and get the Capstone 2 material, but you will be marking your own Capstone 2 cases. You will have solutions, people. You can do that. Okay? It's not a rule that you cannot do that. Okay? So if the finances really are just out of the ballpark and you can't do them even with an installment program, okay, that's flexible. Even if you can't do that, and there's no interest in the installment program. Even if you cannot do that, then go with the 1695 option, okay, and, and do that, and you can still mark your own, and I don't have a problem, and I don't think Michael does either, okay, with basically still preparing you for the exam, feeling that we prepared you for the exam. I prefer the 2375. I think I'm preparing you a little better when you have more feedback. It is what it is, but if you can't do that, then I'm still preparing you Okay, and you definitely can still pass. Believe me, otherwise we wouldn't recommend it as a possibility. If we really believed you could not pass with the 1695, it wouldn't be up here. Okay, I'm not going to give you something I, I really feel that I can't do. Okay, just so you join the course, that would be unethical. And trust me, we're not doing that. 
Okay, but yes, our preference is a twenty three seventy five because we do think your chances are better. I, if I could just interject, there are a couple of questions very quickly. Uh, one person asks the Canadian twenty six twenty five for the integrated course. Is there any other fees charged by pass? The answer is no. The twenty six twenty five covers everything. It covers the full fee to pass as well as the two hundred fifty dollars you pay for the capstone two cases. There are no additional charges beyond that. It's it's it, that it's a complete complete fee, nothing more. Um, someone else asked, uh, what's the last date for registering with PASS? We're very flexible on that. There is no specific cutoff date. The only thing to keep in mind is that if you're interested in attending live classes, if you, you know, you're, you, you obviously want to register in time for the first class if you want to attend live classes, but there is no specific registration deadline for PASS classes. We're very, very flexible. Someone else asked how many installments to provide. If you need an installment program, you would speak with Ira or myself, and we would come up with an installment plan that works for you. We don't have one fixed model in place. We'll come up with a plan that works based on your cash flow. Please go it's ahead. It's flexible. OK. Um, uh, sorry, this one sec. OK. Um, so basically, this is kind of, I think, just kind of a nice way of looking at the whole course. So it's. Um, there's a lot here. Um, somebody asked also, I don't think I ever said it about the videos, how long are they? That really varies. I mean, the videos could be anywhere from like 20 minutes to probably, I don't know, an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and a half for the videos. It's kind of all over the place. It really depends. The live online classes are usually a couple of hours. If we teach a live online class in the evening, we start 7.15. We'll go to, I don't know, 9.30, uh, 9.45, 9.15 depending on the class. So somewhere between, let's say, two hours, um, two and a half hours, maybe two hours, 45 minutes, something like that. So it kind of varies, but that gives you a sense. We're marking a lot of cases. 20 cases, people, is a lot of cases. That's including those Capstone 2 cases. That is a combination of day one, day two, and day three. And we have three counting sessions. So this just gives you an idea of kind of like the extent and yes, if you, if you probably end up comparing this to other programs, you'll see this is just like, to be honest, apples and oranges, because it really is a, it's like, I don't know, we just give a lot, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot more. Okay, I'm that's our contact. I'm sorry to interject again, but just a, I just want to answer a couple of quick questions that people asked. Um, one, one person asks, uh, I'm currently in India and I want to appear in 021 in September. Uh, probably be in Canada by May, by May 2021, how to go for live sessions while in India. Are there any recorded video available for live sessions apart from audit tax and governance? So while you're in India, you can definitely watch the videos. The videos will be made available to you. If we have enough interest in India, we'll even offer live sessions based on India time as opposed to Canadian time. Otherwise, videos will be available for all of the competencies, not just audit tax and governance. And when you come to Canada, you can then start coming to live sessions. The Another question we had was, when does the first live class start for May, September? So for May, the first class starts, for May of 021, the first class will start in the fall, in mid-November of 020. For the September 21, Fifi, the first class will start in mid-January. Please go on, Ira. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's our, uh, sorry, this is our contact information, people. It's all on the website and stuff. Okay, and you can see the WhatsApp numbers at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can even use LinkedIn, better for me, Ira, for LinkedIn. Um, but I am on LinkedIn. You can probably just search my name and, and um, you should be able to get it. Um, we do have a partner in India called Orbit Institutes. This is their information. You guys can look at this um, and you can speak to them. If you have any technical question or anything, they'll probably pass it on to us. But they will be the ones delivering our binder and stuff again because of the whole lockdown at the moment i don't know if you're going to get anyone but they have offices throughout india in about 11 or 13 provinces okay they also prepare people for the u.s cpa um but they also we hooked up with them to basically have a presence in india okay um okay and that's all the contact information again just so you uh, just so you have it should have had my linkedin here but anyway um sorry Okay, so people, look, this is important, um, whether you're in Canada or whether you're in India. So we, you know, we're very proud of the amount of support that we give. In other words, we are very available. 
we answer questions all the time. So if you're watching videos and you're not in an, uh, if you're in a live online session, you can ask a question like similar to today. Okay. And by the way, usually we do get to all the questions. Okay. Um, because <clears throat> the presentation, a lot of times when we're doing the live online sessions, won't be as many people and we won't have necessarily as many questions. But um, if you're doing live online, you can ask questions. The only difference between a live online session and a video session is you cannot ask a question to the video. So what people do is they write us WhatsApp or email, and we're always answering questions. So we feel we do provide a pretty good level of support. It's one of the biggest things that people compliment us on after uh, when they pass. That they're very happy with the level of support. So, I mean, we are here. We're not going to answer the second you write, okay? Just, you know, but honestly, a lot of times the feedback will be very, uh, the feedback will be, watch McCall, it will be very quickly. And you can see the comment at the bottom. That is quite typical of things that we get. There's two of us, which helps, okay? We can each answer, it doesn't matter who you write to. Um, so whether you're in India or whether you're in Canada, um, we think the level of support definitely, it, it, it is part of the program. It is an important part of the program. And, um, you know, we are, we are very available. Now, people, for those Canadian students, for, for those students who are living in Canada now, okay, um, no hard feelings if you want to leave the session, okay, because now I'm going to direct my comments just to people living in India, okay, who will ultimately be coming to Canada to write the exam. Okay, so you can either leave the session or if you want, you can obviously stay into the session, whatever you want, but don't want to bore you. Um, okay, for those people living in India, um, I just mentioned the Orbit Institute. Um, if you're living in India and you haven't done the registration, as I said, register, I don't know, you can start the process after July 1, after July 1. From a fee perspective, it's not going to make any difference and you don't have to be registered with the institute in order to take in order to take our course. Um, every province has a separate institute. People, this might be a little different than in India. I think it is. So every province has a separate institute. So the only difference on which province you register with is that you will be writing the exam in that province. It does not matter where you live. It does not matter where you work. But if you register with Ontario, then you will have to write the exam in Ontario. If you register in British Columbia, you'll have to write the exam in British Columbia. The next day, okay, I don't care. You could, you could have a, a permanent home in Ontario and register in BC, and you'd have to fly to British Columbia to write the exam, and you could fly back afterwards to Ontario. It doesn't matter. The provinces with the most experience dealing with Indian CAs are Ontario, and then BC would follow, British Columbia. But but people, I, I, I interrupt. interrupt. You don't register with British Columbia. Um, if you're going oh. to be writing out West, you would be dealing with a Western School of Business. Uh, all of the Western provinces, you register with one place called the uh, Western Western School of Business. You don't, for the Western provinces, BC, Alberta, and Manitoba, you don't register directly with the province. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. I keep saying British Columbia because usually when I speak to people out West, that's where they're living. Um, I don't know, whatever. It seems to be more popular. But yeah, as Michael said, he's right. Okay, you could live in Calgary. You can live in Edmonton. You could live in Saskatoon. Okay, these are all different places you can live in, different cities. Okay, but as Michael said, you'd register with the Western, with the Western School of Business. Okay, we live in Ontario. And again, there's a lot of Indians, uh, uh, you know, that will live in, what's we call that will live in Ontario. Um, okay. So if you want to find more information, for example, okay, on how do CAs in India go about this process, for example, you would go to this link, for example, let's say you, let's say you were thinking of Ontario. So go to the link I'm showing you here, and they have a special page for people from India. And it's pretty good. It's pretty good. They have all the different places in the world you could come from, basically, and they have different pages for each, for each one, and it's pretty user-friendly. Just go to that link I showed you on the previous slide and find, and in two seconds you'll find the page for people from India and you can see basic requirements and stuff of how to go about the process. Now, with respect to immigrating to Canada, why should you do your CPA before? So people look, we have students that are in India, they start in India. We have students that start when they get to Canada. It doesn't really matter. 
if you're in India, we can run the course identical, really, except for, I guess, at the moment, the live online sessions, the timing is not going to be great if you live in India. But really, it's the same course. The advantage of starting in India is that if you were to get your CPA while you were still in India, it's easier to immigrate, which again, I don't think is that difficult to Canada regardless. And getting a job, your chances will be higher. It's a very respected degree in Canada. I know I saw questions there about finding a job. So people look, it is a very respected degree in Canada. Um, your chances definitely are better if you have a CPA, Canadian CPA. We do have lots of students who have jobs who don't have, they're going through the process, they don't yet have the Canadian CPA. And they're living in Canada, and they still have jobs. Some do, some don't. Obviously, it's easier if you have the Canadian CPA. The ICAI in, um, in Toronto is also an excellent um, organization. And they also have some, uh, they will be able to help a little bit on with jobs and stuff. They have a, a function there where I think you can watch McCall. You can see potential employers and, and things like that. So one thing you should do, people, I, I want to throw this in because it really is true, is that registering with the ICAI is definitely a very good thing. We want you to do it. Uh, we're giving you a 15% discount for those people like in, in Ontario that are registering with the ICAI. So we want you guys to register with them. Um, because we, it's to your advantage. It's, it really is to your advantage, especially with work and things like that. It's totally to your advantage. And they have other resources as well. They can describe their resources um, much better than I can. Okay, But we do think it makes perfect sense. So there's no problem in starting this process when you're in India. Um, it is perfectly fine and in some ways may make a lot more sense than just coming to, to Canada. But again, we, it's mixed. Okay, so I don't know if I answered everything. Here's a couple of links. Again, people, you're going to get the PowerPoint presentation. You guys can look at these links. We're just telling you useful links. Um, I think somebody asked about, do you need the PR in order to simply make a trip to Canada and write the exam? I don't believe so. I think you should be able to come in a tourist visa as if you're taking a trip to Canada. And I believe as long as you're here for those three days, you can write the exam in Canada. I don't think you need your PR. Michael can... can, can um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's correct. I think you could just come to Canada, and as long as you're here for the period, the three days when they're writing the exam, you could write the exam in Canada. Yeah, yeah I would agree with you. I believe that tourism should suffice. Yeah. And we do think, people, it's not now, but we are hopeful that down the road, you'll be allowed to write in India. Okay? We just saw in China, you're allowed to write in several cities um, and in the Caribbean. So they are expanding it. So we do think it's coming. We don't know when, okay? So I'm not telling you when. I don't think it's such a big deal. If at the end of the day, you're making one trip to Canada to write, I don't think it's such a big deal. How much I in total? I, 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 I could just quickly answer just a couple of quick questions. I know we're running a little late, so I'll answer them very quickly. Um, somebody asks, can we get a job without Canadian CPA for Indian CA? Basically, you can get a job in Canada with just an Indian CA, but obviously it's a lot easier to get a job and you can probably get a better job once you have a Canadian CA. But yes, the, you can get in many, we do have many um, Indian CAs who come to Canada and get their first job with just an Indian CA. But the sky's the limit once you have your Canadian CA. Um, someone else asked, uh, do you get more immigration points if you have a CPA? Now, again, Ira and I are obviously not intimately familiar with the whole immigration process. We just have a general knowledge but I believe that having, if you already have a Canadian CPA, I believe that will get you more points and that will improve your chances on your PR. But again, it's hard to answer that exactly definitively, you know, without more knowledge. Okay, so if you want, so if you want to know more about the points for the CPA, you'd be best off going to the website that IRA provided, and there's a lot more detail there. Uh, so again, you may or may not officially get more points. Uh, again, you'd have to look at the website. But there's no question having that having that designation will be helpful. Yeah. But we also find, I mean, I can tell you just anecdotally, what we hear is that immigrating to Canada is not that difficult. Um, even without the C even without the CPA. Um, again, we don't know the ins and the outs of the immigration. Treat this anecdotal, but that is kind of what we hear that immigrating to Canada is not that um, is not that difficult for people who are doing this and want to pursue a Canadian CPA. 
from a total fee perspective, how, how much does the whole thing cost me? This is your slide. You'll notice the past course says 2,625. That's the 2,375 after the discount, plus the $250 for the capstone two material. Again, people, if you were not gonna have us mark the capstone two cases, that 2,625 would be reduced to uh, 1695 plus 250, assuming you bought it, that would be about 1945. There's a one-time registration fee for 125. There's the annual student fee. <clears throat> this is what I meant before. I said it quickly and I said like the annual student fee is about $600. And what they do is they charge you like if you register in the last six months of the year, July 1 to December 31, that will be half, 300. The C fee, 1500. I don't know, travel to Canada, who the heck knows? Approximately, I don't know, we're saying $1,500. So this is Canadian, $6,350. U.S., I guess, with the translation rate, would be about $4,600. We're trying to give an approximation of really what this whole process ultimately would, um, would ultimately cost. Okay, so people, just to conclude, I know it's been a little longer, and I'm sorry at the beginning. Um, I don't even know what time we said, how long it would take, but basically a lot of questions. Um, all right, so just three important takeaways. Number one, yes, it's doable in India. Yes, you can work full-time. This is not meant to be a full-time thing. The earlier you start, the better the chances are. Practice is important. We give you the support, the materials, and everything like that. Um, you don't need perfect technical before you start case writing. That last point we just have to emphasize that because we know it's different than what you did in India, and we want to make sure you understand you're going to be writing cases. You will not be thrilled when you first start writing, but that is part of the learning process. It is very doable. Um, you know. And look, just remember one thing. Anybody with an Indian CA is pretty smart. We know it's a very difficult process in India. Okay, So you're already starting with a major advantage. Yes, you have a disadvantage that it's a different system. And English also sometimes is a disadvantage. So we have to work through that. And again, we try our best with the whole program. But you're also starting with an advantage. And that is you've already passed a difficult technical exam, more so than Canadian students. Okay? So that is an, that is an advantage that people have with an Indian CA. And quite frankly, that's probably the logic in why you don't have to do the Canadian system and why you can get off Capstone 1 and Capstone 2. That's, I'm sure, the, the underlying logic. So there de it definitely is an advantage. This is very doable. We think the program is, you know, we're very happy with the program. We think it's working. Again, we now have experience um, with people not even going to Capstone 1 and 2. And we give a lot of support along the way and are very happy um, to speak to anybody, WhatsApp or anything, if you want to contact us. And again, we can give you uh, more details. So I hope... People, I hope um, everybody found the session useful. Um, Michael, do you have any other, are there any other questions that we didn't address that you want to ask? That really concludes the formal part of the program. But if there's any other questions, if Michael sees them that we want to address, uh, we'll just address them now. And uh, we'll send the uh, copies of this and the recording to everybody. Michael, you're, Michael, you're on mute. Michael, there, actually, please. there actually were some questions that uh, that people asked. One person says, I got rejected for my tourist visa for Capstone One. Is it possible it can be rejected for the CP? You know, to be honest with you, you know, we're not Immigration Canada, so it's very difficult for, for us to answer that. I would suggest that you communicate with Immigration Canada. I provided a link, I believe, on, on um, slide 63 for Immigration Canada. You need to communicate with them because I don't know why your tourist visa was turned down. Impossible for us to answer. That. Michael, make, Michael, please speak into the microphone. So please, uh, so please um, communicate with Immigration Canada. Um, we, we obviously cannot answer that question ourselves because uh, we're not Immigration Canada. I don't know why they turned down your first request for Capstone One. So you need to communicate with them. I'm sorry that we can't uh, we can't answer that. Um, the someone else is asking that their PR holder. They're moving to Toronto uh, after the lockdown. And you want to know about what documents you need for registration with uh, the CPA Provincial Institute. Ira provided a link for CPA Ontario um, if you, uh, for international students. 
if you go to that link, it talks about the various documents you need. So please go to the link. I believe the link is provided for CPA Ontario on slide 60. So if you go to that link, you can learn more about the specific documents you need, okay? Uh, so you'll know that well before you come to Canada, okay? Um, you, you, another person asks, how soon would we suggest uh, you enroll for the classes if you're planning to give the CP in September 021? So as we said earlier, you know, um, it's, if you have a full year, that would be great. So, you know, I would try to register by no later than, uh, than September 020. If you want to even register earlier, like right now, it certainly can't hurt. We said earlier there are some students who will take even a year and a half to prepare. But I would try to do it by latest, just to give yourself the best chance possible. I wouldn't wait till much after September 020, and then you'll really have a full year to study, which would be, which would be wonderful. Yeah, just, just to elaborate, people, look, we have students now in the course that are writing September 2021. Okay, we have people now in the course. There's just is no big downside, to be honest, if you really think you're going to do this to starting earlier. So, you know, you can write more of those practice cases. You can start studying your technical and there's a lot of videos and stuff. You don't have to watch necessarily all the videos, but you can start watching the videos. So as Michael said, you definitely can wait like several months. But if you're just going to be waiting, OK, I'll tell you one thing I would not do. If you're just going to be waiting several months because, I don't know, you're worried about some payment arrangement or something because you're starting earlier, please speak to us first. Because I would not want, quite frankly, and I think Michael would agree with this, I don't want that to be the deciding factor. If there's things in your life between now and the next few months, whatever, and it's not a good time to start, then, of course, you can start a year in advance. That's perfectly fine. But if you're going to wait just because of the money aspect, then you really should speak to us. OK, because that should not I don't think that's a very good reason. And I think it will help you if you start even earlier. So and we can keep you busy. OK, we don't have a problem keeping you busy. That's what we do. So, you know, um, that that's not a good reason. OK, if you have a legitimate reason, fine. If it's work or personal, whatever, there could be 10 other reasons why you want to wait a few months. I get it. But if it's just going to be the money, not a good reason, because we can work with you on that. And, you know, again, if it's financial need and installments and stuff like that, we can work with that. So then you really should be starting before September. Other questions? Michael, did you see anything else? I'm just looking. Um, I think we've answered most questions. Guys, if there's anybody where we missed your question, if you don't mind asking it again now, that would be great. We hope we've covered off the, we hope we've covered off the questions. Yeah, just copy and paste it. Just copy and paste it, and again, I'll if look we, at it if also. We, if we've missed your question. If we missed uh, okay. it. Okay, I think there's some questions coming then. What did you see? It, it, about the validity of, somebody asks about the validity period of videos provided. I thought I had addressed that. Basically, the videos will be available to you to watch as many times as you like, and you will continue to have access to the videos until you pass your exam. So hopefully you'll make it the first try. If you don't make, if you end up having to write twice, you'll have them available until you until you pass, however long that takes. Any other questions? Uh, I think we have some other should questions. I, should I wait till I have enough experience for the CPA to appear for CFI? So I think that question, Rajat's asking, I think that question, um, when you say experience, I'm not sure if you mean like work experience. People, look, I mean, as Michael said, he, he Michael outlined before that you need like, um, if you don't have a university degree, you need five years. If you um, have post-qualification, if you have a university degree, you'll need two years. Work experience is not really, um, from an exam writing standpoint, that important, okay? It's more important for when you ultimately qualify. So, um, you know, this is an exam. If you're in study mode, in some ways, that's even better. You don't have to be. I'm not saying you have to. We have lots of people from India who got their Indian CA in 2010, 2012, 2014. But there's no question, if you, if you just got it like two years ago or a year ago, and you're in study mode, that does not hurt. You don't really need, okay, to be working in industry or in public practice for two, three, four years in order to feel more competent to write the exam. No. They have their certain guidelines on how many years you need to ultimately qualify for the CPA. But from an exam writing standpoint, to pass the exam doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter. Okay, so I, I think I answered, I hopefully I answered that. 
There's someone else who has a question here. Um, if someone is having interest in finance and stock market related activities, like fundamental and technical analysis and assistance and financial planning, and want to choose it as a career, what is your suggestion? Again, I'm not sure what your question is. Are, are you asking whether a CPA would be useful for that? You know, I think a CPA would be useful, although to be entirely honest with you, uh, if you're going for a career in finance, you can either do a CPA or you can do a CFA, depending exactly on where you're going to work. One or the other may be useful or they may both be they may both be useful. Um, someone else asks, is it easier to be a Canadian CPA through an MOU with India or through or through the U.S.? Because the person here holds, I guess, both a U.S. CPA and an Indian CA. Uh, to be honest with you, if you if you meet certain conditions, you need to speak to the provincial institute you're dealing with. Somebody with a U.S. CPA may not even have to write the CP, but there are certain work experience requirements. So you'd have to speak directly to the provincial institute to see if you have the experience required necessary experience requirements necessary. Once you have a U.S. CPA and you have certain experience, you may be able to avoid writing the CP completely. So before you before you write based on the MOU, please contact the whatever provincial institute you're dealing with and discuss with them your specific situation. And that will determine whether whether you can avoid writing the CP or not by using your US CPA. Um, if somebody asks, is the fee inclusive of HST? Again, for those of you who are not living in Canada, uh, you would not have to pay HST in any case. Um, Otherwise, people living in Canada, you know, HST is, is a requirement. The fees we gave you are, are not, um, do not include HST. Um, and uh, somebody asked, is a university degree from open learning valid? I, I, I've never, I don't know if Ira's heard of that. I'm not, I don't know what open learning is. Have you heard of that, Ira? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't think it's something that either of us is really competent to answer. What ends up happening, people, is that you guys submit your transcripts to the provincial institute, and they will, you know, they, they will look at your transcripts. I'm not sure of the answer to that either, um, but you know what I mean, like what they count. Again, I've always understood that it's pretty, it's a pretty wide range when we talk about the university degree. Um, it's a pretty wide range that I think they will accept, um, and the impact again is whether you need two years or five years of experience. So uh, again, I think it's pretty broad, but that's something really that they would be able to answer. You just have to speak to one of the provincial institutes in order to ask them, and they probably will tell you, please submit your um, please submit your transcripts from the university, and then they'll make a then they'll make a determination. Yeah. And um, somebody was asking about articling. Somebody's asking, um, you know, in India, you have to article with a CPA firm. In Canada, the, if, if you if for Canadian students, they also have to article, although it's a lot broader, they can article either with a CPA firm or an industry. If you're coming as an Indian CA, as long as you have the required experience, there is no articling required. So the vast majority of Indian CAs do not need to do any articling in Canada. Okay, uh, thank you for clarifying what open means. Uh, I understand that, that it's correspondence, not a regular college, but as Ira says, that's something that the Provincial Institute would have to deal with. It, it, we, you know, we're just not qualified to answer that. Okay, oh, there's a follow-up question here. Yeah, Rajat, I thought I answered that, but you're saying, well, it mean work experience after two years or whatever, you're asking, you know, when you should write the CFE. So, so again, yeah, you can write the CFE, even if you don't have that work experience, but ultimately, you know what I mean, you would need the two years or the um, or the five years work experience. And no, it will not make really much of a difference on your potential for success on the exam itself. I think Michael answered, is a fee inclusive of HST? Again, people, if you're writing from India, there is no HST because you're a foreign student. Um, if you're writing, so yeah, so anyway, um, if you're writing from India, it's not going to matter. You're not going to have any HST. Um, I don't see anything here. I don't know, Michael, if you see any other questions. Yeah, I think we're, I think we've answered all the questions. Um, so I just I just want to thank everybody for for attending the session. It was a pleasure delivering it. Um, I hope everybody learned. I hope everybody learned a lot about the process. Um, as 
as Ira and I mentioned at the beginning of the session, you know, there's no question after you leave the session, you may think of further questions. That's why we provided you with contact information. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email us or WhatsApp us or contact us in any of the matters we've indicated on the slide and we'll answer any further questions that you have. Okay, so people, thank you very much. I guess we're going to sign off now. And again, we hope everybody found it useful. And that really concludes the um, past uh, session. Take care.